Welcome to another edition of Physician Focus. I'm Dr. Dale McGee. Local boards of health are invisible to many citizens, but their work in communities across the state and the nation is critical to our collective well-being and safety. This edition of Physician Focus will take an in-depth look at public health efforts at the community level by examining local boards of health and how they operate. We'll look at the responsibilities of those boards, who sits on them, the enforcement powers that they have, how they're managed and operated, the obstacles that they face in performing their duties, as well as how they relate to other agencies, such as the State Department of Public Health and federal agencies. Joining me for this discussion are Dr. Christopher Quinn and Ms. Cheryl Sabara. Dr. Quinn is the Director of Occupational Health Services at Sturdy Memorial Hospital in Attleboro, Massachusetts, and the President of the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards. Board certified in physical medicine and rehabilitation, Dr. Quinn is also the physician for the Attleboro Health Department. Ms. Sabara is Senior Staff Attorney for the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards, and in that capacity provides legal consultation, policy guidance, and technical assistance to boards of health and municipal governments throughout the Commonwealth. She also teaches public health law to local boards of health as part of the association's certificate program. Chris and Cheryl, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Chris, I'm gonna start with you. What is the mission of local boards of health? What, what do boards of health do? Well, in Massachusetts, local boards of health are entrusted with providing safe drinking water mm -hmm. and food inspections from restaurants, making sure proper regulations are passed so that the community as a whole is safe and healthy. That mm -hmm. might include tobacco regulations uh, or a variety of other things. So they are passing legislation. Yes. Uh, or are they passing regulations that they have the power to pass? Is this something that people vote on or is it something that they actually have the power to do? Can I take that one, please? Yeah. Thank you. Um, it, it, that's a very good question, and, and I think there's a little bit of confusion in the public, and actually I think there's a little bit of confusion within municipal government about exactly what sort of legal authority boards of health have. Um, the Massachusetts legislature actually gave boards of health the obligation and the authority to protect the public health, safety, and welfare, very similar to powers that are given to the police and to, to fire departments. Mm -hmm. So boards of health are actually charged with protecting public health, and in doing that, they can pass local board of health regulations. And they pass those regulations just like a town meeting or a city council would pass an ordinance, they have the authority to pass regulations. Both ordinances and regulations are local public health laws. Mm -hmm. And this sometimes does create a natural tension between um, the legislative body of a town, which is either their town meeting or their city council, and the Board of Health, because both have the authority to pass them. And boards of health are either elected mm -hmm. or appointed. They can be appointed. In a city, they're always appointed. Mm -hmm. And in a town, they can be either elected or appointed. So you can hear just from what I'm describing that it can be confusing to people that sit within municipal government, so you mm -hmm. can imagine and how confusing it can be for um, those that live in municipalities that aren't dealing with this on a day-to-day -day basis. So what kind of skill set are we looking at for <laughs> members of a Board of Health? What, what background do they, should they have? They come from all walks of life, and, and Chris can go into a little more detail, but they, just like a selectman mm -hmm. or a planning board member, there are no... Um, requirements of certain skill sets that Board of Health members should have, which is why the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards has a certificate program every year to try to teach Board of Health members the skills that we found through our experience mm -hmm. are um, helpful to be mm -hmm. on boards. Um, nursing, Board of Health members can be nurses, um, physicians, in fact, in cities, there is a requirement that there be a physician on the board. In towns, there is not the same requirement. I don't have an answer to why that is, but it's just the way the law was passed. Mm -hmm. um, 
parents are, are frequently members of boards of health that are looking at ways to protect the public health and improve the health of, of the community. So they, they really come from all different mm -hmm. walks of life. Mm -hmm. And the yeah. skill set can be learned um, through programs like the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards. I think some people get involved because they feel as though they have some experience or skill set. Some people get involved because they have a particular issue they want to address by a board of health. So it's a variety, but it can be anywhere from someone who does engineering work, someone who does septic system work, someone who's involved in healthcare, such as a nurse or a physician. Um, but it really can be pretty much anyone. And you're, you're basically, if we look at the scope of services that, that they are involved with, we're dealing with inspections. Sure. <clears throat> we're dealing with infectious disease. Yes. We're dealing with threats to the public health, uh, defined sure. in a variety of ways. Sure. So what kinds of staff would they need uh, to be able to allow themselves to function? What kind of people work uh, yeah. for the Well, on a health? city level, you'd have a number of individuals as part of the health department. You'd have a health agent who actually does the septic system inspections. Uh, you would have a health agent, an assistant health agent, do food inspections at the restaurants. A health nurse would be involved to do you know, school-based <coughs> vaccination programs. And, uh, you know, with uh, if an immigrant population or families moving in, make sure they're up to date on the vaccinations. So you might have a number of individuals, and that's not even to mention the secretarial staff. Mm -hmm. And they're involved with uh, permitting as well, uh, burial permits, for example, Absolutely. other things in which there may be a, uh, an element of public health threat? Yeah, absolutely, with burial permits, and uh, as you know in the last 10 years, with uh, you know emergency preparedness, mm -hmm. and not just a terrorist kind of preparedness, but all <coughs> hazards preparedness with weather and Storm. these types of issues. Sure. And I would just add to that, um, what, what Chris is describing is in an ideal world, you would have a very well-resourced health department that would consist of all of those folks. Um, however, in many of our towns, especially in very rural areas of our state, for instance, in, in western Massachusetts specifically, and in parts of um, on the Cape, you have the exact same duties However, you may have one staff person or mm -hmm. a half a staff person, someone who comes in not even 20 hours a week. Sometimes it's four or five hours a week. Mm -hmm. um, and they have the same duties and obligations as a full-fledged health department that you would find in a city like Attleboro or Boston or Worcester or Springfield. So that does present a lot of challenges for mm -hmm. these smaller um, boards of health. And it's something that historically has been a challenge in Massachusetts because we have 351 local boards of health all charged with protecting the public health of every member of the community. So there have been, I'm, there has been an evolution of public health. It is something which perhaps in the mid 19th century or so came into being in Massachusetts and then gradually has moved forward. What are the kinds of things that public health has been uh, successful in uh, and has helped uh, the public with? Well, as Cheryl explained, where there's so many areas where they reach into and are part of, um, I'd say su success has been reached in certainly food inspections, making sure mm -hmm. when you go out to a restaurant you're eating safe food. Um, certainly the water that's provided at the uh, city level um, on the basic level and that includes the septic systems which have to be maintained and, mm -hmm. and inspected so uh, those are just basic you know food and water areas and I, and I think that what Chris is talking about here is sort of the unsung hero work that local boards of health do that no one sees because they're doing such a good job. Right. You rarely hear about someone getting sick from eating in a restaurant. That's because of the work that boards do. Some of the work that is more visible that boards have done, I think, and have done extremely well and have really done almost, um, have really led the charge is if you look at tobacco control mm -hmm. work in Massachusetts. Massachusetts. It started in local boards of health about 20 years ago when they started passing local regulations. It was not an easy thing to do. There was a lot of controversy surrounding it. Um, you wouldn't have thought 20 years ago that bars in Massachusetts would be completely smoke free. Now you wouldn't think that you could ever smoke in a bar. I mean, we've really, local boards of 
health have been the heroes in changing social norms surrounding tobacco in Massachusetts. And that's an interesting point because I think one of the other things you're bringing up is that the public health approach has uh, been accomplished in collaboration with others. Yes. So we have seen a massive decrease in the um, incidence of smoking and smoking related health illnesses, or illnesses rather, um, as a result of employers putting in place uh, smoke-free workplace uh, rules for their, rules, their right. employees. And then the local communities with the, the restaurant regulations and the like. Um, and that is, is something that uh, means that, to me, means that these boards are also collaborating with others and getting the cooperation of others to get their job done. It's the only way they can really do their work. Right. Is to bring the community into the fold and to bring in other stakeholders like employees employers, yeah. like legislators, um, parents, um, you know, even unions. I mean, there was a, yeah. a huge support for this um, endeavor by the um, hospitality union mm -hmm. because their workers were the ones who were really suffering from, mm -hmm. from this. But that's one example of, mm -hmm. I think, the evolution of public health in Massachusetts getting involved in, in policy initiatives. Yeah, Local. I mean, the rates have gone from 50 percent of adults in America smoking to less than 20 percent so right I think when you frame it as not so much individual rights to smoke but you know you're exposing workers to secondhand in some cases worse than uh, direct inhalation of combustible tobacco uh, is more harmful so once you framed it in that regard I think people got on board and understood the importance and, and this improves the environment, it, it improves the health of others, it prevents illness um, and, and prolongs life. Now, there are other instances in which there is, is uh, some overlap with uh, traditional medical care. Uh, one that comes to mind is vaccination, uh, in which one may go to their physician's office and get a vaccine. Sure. There may be a public health clinic. Absolutely. Uh, how, how, is, uh, how do you work with that? Well, a lot of that depends on funding, whether it's at a local level or a state level. But certainly, if a child is coming into a community and is going to start school, they need to be up to date <coughs> on their vaccinations. It's a state requirement. And if they haven't connected with a pediatrician, that falls on the local board of health or health department. So there, the public health nurse is very, very important working with the nurses in the schools mm -hmm. to make sure the child is up to date. So they may actually set up a clinic in the school to take care of the vaccinations Sometimes. for those students. Sometimes okay. it's done right there in the uh, town hall. Excellent. And you mentioned uh, refugees coming into a community. Sure. And um, uh, that is something which I think uh, is being seen increasingly. Mm -hmm. and, and how does public health interact with, with uh, those individuals? Usually on the front line, it's a very interesting uh, interaction because you're dealing with people who uh, historically may have come from a country that the, they're not as trustful of the government, so there has to be that that trust instilled and a nurse is a perfect person to start that trust but um, to then provide what they need reaches out into other areas of the social services of the community and then once you have someone plugged into those services then they become an active member of the community and a healthy active member. And, and you're getting at a really interesting and, and challenging area for boards of health and that's looking at and one of the things, things, one of the services that boards of health are charged with performing is really looking at disparities in a municipality and addressing those disparities. And I think the community looks to the boards of health to actually help with that outreach, with, with getting to every community member in whatever way they can. And we do provide, and the Department of Public Health provides training on reaching disparate populations. Mm -hmm. And, and we're seeing it, it's an increasing issue. The health risks are different. The cultures are different. The reasons for some of their risky, the risk of risky behavior can be different. So there are, it, it, it's really this, this whole area is something that boards are spending more and more time concentrating on as, as they should be. And just as you say that, it occurs to me that in dealing with these, uh, uh, refugees or the poor or other disadvantaged populations that having someone at the local level who, who may know them, who may build up a relationship with them makes the entire process a lot more effective and a lot friendlier and, and uh, uh, so I can see where a small board of health may provide something that you know the, the home office a few hundred miles away may not. Right. 
and, and there also there are many boards of health that hire um, staff that are multilingual for, mm -hmm. for that reason. Um, especially with emergency preparedness, this has come up time and time again, the need to really understand your populations. And you're getting at another piece here, which just is that interface between the private person, the individual rights, and the good of the public, or, or the necessity for education and convincing people, or, or the like. And I can see, just as I listen to you, uh, a lot of things. Uh, you know, we are exposed to controversies regarding vaccination. Yes. We are exposed to controversies regarding fluoridating water. Yes. Um, we uh, may see a call to tell people to leave their homes because the storm is coming. And um, uh, we may have instances in which a, a particular individual's lifestyle may uh, present a threat to the, the, the neighborhood that they are in, whether it's through hoarding or um, in some other way uh, uh, threatening the neighborhood. Can you give me some thoughts on that as to how that, that line is, is tread? Yeah, it's uh, very delicate, especially uh, if you're asking someone who's been exposed to an infectious disease to stay in their home and not move about. We're a very free-moving society with our cars and freeways, and mm -hmm. people don't like to be told to stay at home. But I think once you explain the, the reason, uh, then they go along with that. As far as the hoarding, um, it can be, uh, you know, dangerous to the firefighters of the community. You know, if they're responding and they can't get through the dwelling, uh, that can be dangerous to them. So, you know, it, it's not just the individual, but we, we have to look at other people who are affected. So I'm curious, when it comes to hoarding, um, what sorts of criteria, what sorts of things do you look for to say that that individual is crossing the line? Well, it's usually quite apparent, uh, you know, when uh, someone has, uh, you know, a, a call to their to their dwelling because maybe there's a small fire in, say, a toaster oven, um, and then it becomes quite apparent to the firefighters they need to bring somebody in who can help this individual clear the area over time and get the proper social services usually that they need to help with the issues of why they're collecting all their their belongings and uh, and, and Chris that that's a really good point I went before I was a public health attorney I did some um, I was in private practice and I had a client who was a hoarder I didn't know that she was a hoarder until I went over to her house to have her sign some documents and and it it's it's a perfect example, Dale, of what you were speaking of previously, where boards really need to look to other facets of the municipality mm. in order to try to help rectify a situation, because this is a situation, as Chris said, where you've got fire code violations, you've got, um, you, a lot of times, you've got council on aging mm -hmm. um, interest in the situation, you've got mental health issues. A, a, a hoarding situation really involves a whole host of municipal departments, and that's really um, the only way that you can really address this issue. And you also brought up, you know, that balancing test between individual behavior and public health protectiveness. And we regulate individual behavior all the time. We require helmets for motorcycles. Um, we, there, we require seat belts. Those are individual behaviors. We require smoke detectors. Um, and boards of health have the legal authority to pass regulations that regulate individual behavior. But what I always like to say when I'm teaching is, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Right. That you, you have to walk that balancing test between what is um, an, an individual behavior that needs to be regulated to protect public health and what is one that maybe is maybe isn't maybe isn't the best thing for you to be regulating either because it's really hard for you to enforce mm -hmm. or because the municipality isn't ready for that kind of, of local public health law. And it also sounds to me like the Board of Health issues regulations over which it has authority and which it then will intend to enforce as a Board of Health. Correct. But there may yes. be instances that involve the public health that the board hasn't passed, but the local legislature has, uh, seatbelt mm -hmm. laws. Could I mean, be. the Board of Health isn't going out there issuing citations if you're not wearing your seatbelt. is that w That is passed by and is within the jurisdiction of the legal system. Right. 
and and that's sure. one of the um, issues that w we always like to make clear that the enforcement efforts of boards of health are their goal is compliance mm -hmm. not punishment mm -hmm. it's compliance not fines not f we're not there to fine right. you or to put you in jail we're there to get compliance however we can mm -hmm. um, and and but that's the reasonable. strategy it mm -hmm. needs to be reasonable mm -hmm. and it needs to get to compliance mm -hmm. what are the challenges uh, going forward with public health. Where do you see public health going in the next five years or so? Well, certainly with the all hazards preparedness, moving away from terrorist preparedness and moving into harsh weather, especially in New England uh, preparedness, um, getting, getting into other areas that you know, come up as far as infectious disease, vector-borne disease, whether it's you know, Lyme disease or many other illnesses that are coming in from other countries that we have to have people aware of and mm -hmm. uh, prepared to um, you know, do the proper precautions. So what about monitoring? Uh, to, to detect disparities, to monitor infectious disease, you need to have some sort of system that is sending you a signal that you need to pay attention to a, a new threat. What, what are the tools of that trade? Well, I think the where infectious disease, when you see a number of cases, whether it's the physicians or pediatricians calling in to the local board of health who are then supposed to be calling Department of Public Health at the state level to alert them, that's one way in which uh, the alert goes out. But um, monitoring cases, and if you see a trend, then certainly taking action, asking for the state DPH to help you take action. and. Uh, you know, whether it's increased spraying of mosquitoes in a particular area or whatever, uh, whatever the case may be. And Dale, this is an area where um, resources are sorely lacking in some of the boards that I described previously. And this is where the Department of Public Health really can step in and has stepped in to really assist local communities in doing some of this monitoring work. Um, it's really a daunting task for an underfunded, um, understaffed Board of Health to, to be doing, yet it's certainly one of their ten essential services. I would like to see boards in the next five or ten years to getting involved more proactively in chronic disease prevention, mm -hmm. in um, increasing physical activity and improving nutritional standards in municipalities. And we know there are ways to do that through policies, through education, through outreach, but if you don't even have the resources to do the vaccinations you need to do, the, the infectious disease reporting, the restaurant inspections, it's really hard to get to these other initiatives that we know through tobacco control could really change community norms by making the easy choice the healthy choice. Exactly. And there are emerging issues, Dale, uh, yep. like electronic cigarettes and the nicotine. We've seen you know, poisonings of children in the households where these refill liquids are. and. Uh, those are emerging issues that we need to address. There's a, an awful lot that we've covered in such a brief time. We're getting near the end of our show here. Uh, are there any other things? Cheryl, do you have any other messages that, that you may want to touch on? Well, my message would be twofold. Um, number one, to Board of Health members, I want to thank them for the work that they do. And I want them to be proud to market that work. I mean, marketing is a word that Boards of Health aren't very comfortable with. But uh, people need to know what Boards of Health do. And to other members, members of the community that I'm hoping are watching this tonight, I want them to really think about how safe they are in their municipality. They're not afraid to go to a restaurant. Mm -hmm. They're not afraid of an epidemic that's going to, um, th that might rear its ugly face. Um, they can go to a ball field and rest assured that if there is a threat, a mosquito threat that's serious, the Board of Health will take action. Mm -hmm. and not allow that game to be played mm -hmm. that night. So if, if 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 everyone from this from watching this can just get a little bit better sense of the necessity and the um, good work that lo their local board of health is doing, that would be wonderful. Excellent. 
Chris, any further messages from you? Yeah, I would encourage those in the healthcare professions, nursing physici or physicians out there, get involved with the boards of health. You have a unique tool set, uh, mm -hmm. experience set. Often you're on the front line of public health, seeing what's coming in for flu, uh, vector-borne illnesses. Get involved and uh, that, that would be my message. Yeah. Excellent. Well, Chris and Cheryl, thank you so much uh, thank for this you, conversation Dale. today. Thank this you, is, Dale. has really been a good conversation. I, I really think we've gotten a lot out of it. Okay, for more information about public health efforts at the local, state, and federal levels, visit the websites listed at the end of our show. And to view past physician focused programs, visit our website at physicianfocus.org. I'm Dr. Dale McGee. Thank you for watching. I'm Dr. Christopher Quinn. Ever since 1799, when Paul Revere chaired the first Board of Health in Boston, local boards of health have been protecting our public health. While invisible to many residents, the work of the municipal health official plays a crucial role in protecting our health and safety. Boards of health act as the local arms of the state departments of public health and environmental protection. They are given legal authority to set and enforce regulations, and their work covers a wide range of activities. Among their functions are disease prevention and control, food service and restaurant inspections, regulation of the sale of tobacco to minors, enforcement of the housing and sanitary codes, the oversight of disposal of hazardous and solid waste, and the protection of the environment from damage and pollution. To learn more about how your Board of Health protects you and how you might help, visit the Massachusetts Association of Health Boards at mahb.org. I'm Dr. George Abraham. Infectious disease is the largest single cause of death worldwide and results from viruses, bacteria, and other pathogens that enter the body and multiply. The infections can range from mild to deadly. Common methods of infection include skin contact, inhaling airborne particles, drinking or eating contaminated water or food, or bites from insects. Vaccines are the best strategy against many infectious diseases, so children and adults should stay up to date with their immunizations. In warm weather, remember to guard against mosquito and tick-borne diseases like West Nile virus and Lyme disease. And if you travel overseas, be especially cautious of diseases endemic to other countries. An outbreak in the United States can be just a plane ride away. For more information on infectious disease, visit the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention at cdc.gov travel.